Well, if you have your Bible, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. We are starting our new study through 1 Timothy. We'll probably do six or seven um, studies looking through this. And uh, there's a lot here uh, in 1 Timothy. And uh, so 1 Timothy chapter 1, title of our study is Leadership Wanted. You know, the world is looking up to leaders. And oftentimes we put celebrities on a pedestal. Sometimes we shouldn't do that. <laughs> Other times they want to be put on a pedestal. And uh, it reminded me of a quote that Marilyn Monroe once said. She was asked about uh, her leadership. And uh, she said, to put it bluntly... I seem to have a whole superstructure with no foundation, but I'm working on that foundation. And if you know how her story ends, it ends in tragedy. Um, it could have been much different if she had a stronger foundation, uh, friends that cared about her, uh, if she had connected to a local church, had found faith in the Lord. Um, so many people have great and growing talent, but no foundation. And if we desire to be a leader in the workplace, at home, in the church, in our community, we need to have that solid foundation. And that's what Paul is writing to Timothy about, um, to, to be that leader that God has called him to be. It's been said that adversity is the litmus test for leadership. Adversity is the litmus test for leadership. Right? Anyone can have that title, CEO. The boss man, <laughs> right? Uh, pastor or dad. But when adversity comes, then you find out, <laughs> are they really a leader or not? Or do they just have the title? And, uh, and that was what was going on with young Timothy and Ephesus. He responded to God's call uh, to go to the Ephesus and to be a part of the church plant there and to minister to the saints and um, trouble began to arise. People began to um, question his leadership. And, uh, and Paul had sent him there. Uh, Timothy was a trusted brother in the Lord. And uh, so Paul wrote this letter to encourage him and to help him. And uh, Paul wrote this about 64 AD. Uh, and, and Paul's main thrust in this letter is to encourage all of us in leadership, again, in the church, at home, in the workplace, in our community. God has desired for us to be leaders. Now, we wouldn't be followers of this world, but we'd be leaders. We'd be following Jesus Christ. And through that, we'd be leading other people towards Him. And uh, so we'll be looking at three things here in chapter 1 this morning. The first is we'll look at teaching sound doctrine. The second is proclaiming the gospel. And then thirdly, we'll look at defending the faith. And we'll see how all three of those are so important to leadership, to biblical leadership. So with that, let's read verse 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope, to Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. I love that we get this letter, greetings from Paul. And from the very start of his greeting, he affirmed his authority as a servant of Jesus Christ. He says that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. He has been personally sent out by Jesus to minister and uh, those who were giving Timothy trouble um, needed to be reminded that Paul had been given authority by God to go. And that Paul had then uh, trusted Timothy to go. And, uh, and that he was there, really, both of them, because God had sent them. It's a reminder to me that there's no better place to be than where God desires you to be. <laughs> And there's no safer place to be in the center of God's will. We want to make sure that we're doing the things God has called us to do. 
If you're not, you're going to feel frustrated. You're going to feel an unsettling in your spirit. You're just going to feel not content. And so we want to be where God desires us to be. And that's right where Timothy was. He was in Ephesus. And uh, again, he had been a companion of Paul. Had been on many journeys with him. And, uh, and so Paul had given the authority to him to, to be there. And uh, I love that in verse 2, he calls Timothy a true son in the faith. Timothy was like a son to Paul. Uh, you know, it's often thought that Paul actually got to lead Timothy in that decision to surrender to Jesus Christ. Uh, we know that Timothy's uh, grandmother had poured into him and his mother as well. And, uh, and we see that Paul also says, Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. I like that. <laughs> and most of Paul's letter, he uses, what, grace and peace. When, he, when he's writing to young pastor Timothy, and we see this in Titus as well, he throws in another word, mercy. <laughs> if you've ever tried to do something for the Lord, and uh, that's called ministry, and you need mercy. <laughs> you need God's mercy as you take that step of faith, as you uh, trust Him. And, uh, you know, we need God's mercy. Justice is getting what we deserve, right? We do something wrong, there's consequences. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. It's like standing before the judge and he says, you're free to go. You know, I'm going to give you mercy. <laughs> and that's what God gives us. And we want to give that to others. And, and God really gives us grace. Getting what we don't deserve, right? We deserve to be separated from him. We deserve hell. But God has not only saved us and rescued us, he's adopted us. It's like we were in the enemy's camp. We were in his prison. And Jesus Christ came and destroyed the battle. All, all the people in the army, right? Just wiped all the whole thing. It was a quick battle. Uh, unlocked us from the prison cell. Brought us to his kingdom. But not only that, he says, come and sit at my table. Now you're the heir of this kingdom. Not only that, but you're, you're a co-heir. And you're a citizen I've adopted you. You're in my family. You're going to eat at the table with me. You're going to enjoy all the benefits and all the blessings. That's what God has done for us. And, and that is grace. <laughs> and that is the beauty of coming to know the Lord. Allowing Him to, to change and transform us as we become more and more like Him. What well, Paul tells us uh, here in verses uh, 3 through 11, really in this section... His instructions and uh, to-do list for Timothy, which is teaching sound doctrine. There's a lot of doctrine out there. A lot of weird things. I mean, if you want, I don't encourage this, but you could Google or YouTube. There's some weird ideas floating out there with UFOs to uh, Indiana Jones really found the, the lost ark, you know, of the, the covenant and <laughs> some weird things. Um, we want sound doctrine. And the only way we get sound doctrine is through the word of God. And that's what Paul says here in verse 3. He says to Timothy, I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. We'll pause there. Timothy's got a to-do list, really, of three things. Stay in Ephesus. Stay where God has called you. When times get tough, what is that phrase? <laughs> when, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, right? When times get tough, the godly stay put. <laughs> we do what God has called us to do. We, we depend upon Him for our strength. And, and that's what God had called Timothy to do. Stay there. This is where I've called you. It's going to be difficult. No one said uh, serving the Lord is easy. And then he gave him a second command. Stop those who are teaching what's contrary to the truth. Use God's word to show them they're off. Right? They're talking about fables and genealogies. and There's just disputes. It's not leading to edification. Stop them. Show them through God's word. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. 
you'd rather have the love of God flowing through your life than having so much head knowledge that you don't do anything with it, right? James said that we want to be just not hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And so his third thing he told them to do was, uh, kind of goes with that. Don't let people waste their time in these discussions, these endless speculations. They don't help people live that life of faith. There's a lot of speculations out there. We talked a little bit about one of them last Thursday about Good Friday and possibly that Jesus was maybe crucified on Thursday. Do we really know? No. Does it change that he died for our sins on the cross, was buried and rose again? No. So it's really speculation. Now, sometimes it's fun to intellectually think through those things, but we don't make a doctrine out of that. And that's what some were doing. And that's what some have done today. They take a couple verses... They make a whole doctrine out of it. And uh, sadly, there are many churches out there that do that. Um, they, they take a verse that says, you know, if the husband and the wife are believing, the kids are sanctified. And somehow they get that verse and say, well, then that means that if we confirm or baptize a child, then they're saved the rest of their life. And you think, what? <laughs> How did you get that from that verse? You know, or, or purgatory, right? That there, there's a, a supposed to be a place between heaven and hell. And uh, you think, well, whoa, wh- where are you grabbing all this from? And it's these obscure references. So we want to make sure we know God's word, but we know it in context, right? That we, we understand, we have that 2020 vision. When you find a verse in scripture, read 20 verses before it, 20 verses after it. Get that 2020 vision. Read it in context. Understand what God is saying. And that's what, what God's desire was here for Timothy. In fact, in verse 3, he used this word urge. It could really be translated, I charge you, I beseech you, I'm commanding you. It's really uh, stemming from this military word that means to give strict orders from a superior officer. Paul is telling Timothy, not only are you a pastor of the church in this difficult city, you're a Christian soldier under orders from the king. Pass these orders along to the soldiers in your ranks. And that's the picture here is Paul saying, Now, Timothy, you're in charge. <laughs> God has called you to be the servant leader in this community. You need to pass that along to those around you. So God had committed to, uh, to, to Paul the word and to Timothy and then Timothy to others who were faithful. And, uh, and we need that instruction. We need that encouragement, that we need to have that heart uh, that leads towards godly edification, right? That's the purpose, is edification, that building up of the saints. Uh, That's the purpose we gather together, uh, is to encourage one another to be built up in the Lord and the things of the Lord. Well, next, Paul tells us a little bit more of some of the instructions here in verse 5 to 7. He says, Now the purpose of the commandments is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, nor the things which they affirm. Paul's main thrust and instruction here, his main purpose and orders, we see here, In verse 5, that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and genuine faith. That's also God's desire for us. That we would love people with a pure heart. And you can tell when people are phony, right? (laughs) I mean, we see it in the kids when we tell them, you know, say you're sorry to your brother. Sorry. Well, come on, you know, love them. (laughs) And God wants us to do the same. Right? He wants us to love Him and love others with that pure heart. People can see it. People can spot that if we're faking it. And God wants us to have that heart that's pure. A heart that is changed and transformed. Now, if we can't, if we're having difficulty loving Him or loving someone else, ask God to help you. He will. And you find as you begin to pray for people, as you begin to lift those concerns of the Lord, He begins to change your heart. You begin to learn you know what? That person's not so bad. They need the Lord, just like I need the Lord. And you can begin to learn to love them. Now, he also says here, um, a good conscience. 
The word conscience is literally two words that are joined together. Con means with, and science means knowledge. So God has given each of us a God-given conscience. That we have this inner voice. We have something that's with knowledge. When you take something that's not yours, that inner voice says, you shouldn't do that. That's not right. That's stealing. <laughs> or when you tell a lie, uh, that inner voice says, you know, that's not really true. Uh, you, you're, you should have said that. You know, now you're going to get in trouble if you don't make things right. <laughs> that's the God-given conscience. And we want to obey that conscience. You know, my, one of my family members the other day was asking, uh, as we were going up to the men's conference, um, about work. Uh, a week ago, we had a bowling fundraiser for our kids, and he was asking if I had made up that time that we were there. And I said, I actually clocked in an hour early. I worked from home, and then I actually worked a couple hours afterwards. I said, now my boss is okay with me not doing that. But I, wanna, I can't do that without having a clear conscience. If I lay my head on that pillow, my conscience is going to say, Now, Tim, you really kind of cheated your employer. You kind of took some time away, and you need to make that up. You need to make things right. And so you want to live with that clear conscience. Uh, you want to be able to, to live with that conscience that, that you know you're not misusing the things that God has entrusted to you. And he also says that we need to have a sincere Faith, that sure faith, and I love this word sincere. Uh, it literally has this illustration with it. Uh, in the Greco-Roman culture, when they would have a vase or a statue or or anything like that, some sort of pottery, um, they would grab. Uh, uh, usually, the people who were making it, if they would just sell them by the dozen, and sometimes they would accidentally get a crack in it. But they didn't want people to know that. So they would grab some wax and put in that crack and make it kind of look like it's okay, right? They'd smooth it out and you really couldn't tell. Except when you took that out into the sun, the direct light, and put it up in the light. Then you could see if it's sincere. And that's the word here. God wants our faith to be sincere, right? We know that we've got some cracks in our life. <laughs> we've got some areas that need work. But who are we trusting in? Self, the world, the government, or the Lord? Our faith is sincerely in the Lord. We've realized that. We can't do it on our own. We need the Lord Jesus Christ. So, that's the desires. We'd have this sincere faith in the Lord. And, and there were those in, in this area that were turning aside to a talk. They wanted to be teachers, but they were uh, teaching things they didn't really understand. Uh, there were those who were misusing the Old Testament law. They didn't understand the intent or the purpose of God's law. They were leading people out of the liberty of grace into the bondage of legalism. And that's, that's tragically uh, still happening today. There are those that believe uh, you can be perfected in the flesh. That there are things that you can do to get closer to God on your own and things you can do to save yourself on your own. And people love this, right? It's religion. It's, it's also legalism because there's a list of rules and regulations that you can put a check mark next to and know, you know, I did this and I did this and I did this. And look how holy I am. Look how righteous I am. And the Lord looks down and says, well, your heart needs a lot of work. <laughs> your heart is far from me. In fact, Jesus said that to the religious leaders of his day, right? This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. He called them a, a, a whitewashed tomb, right? That inside was dead man's bones. The outside was washed clean and looked nice, but there was a heart issue. He would tell them, you know, just as this pitcher or this cup on the outside looks beautiful, looks clean, looks sparkly. The inside, not so clean. And God is more concerned with our heart. And uh, there were many in this area that were misunderstanding the purpose of the law. And there's many today that want to go back to the Old Testament. We need to keep the Sabbath. We need to keep the rules and regulations. You can't eat bacon anymore because that's, that's not allowed in the Old Testament. And there are people that are pushing this on Christians, not only then, but today as well. 
And so Paul clears that up here in verses 8 through 11. And he says here in verse 8, But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there's any other thing that's contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. So Paul starts off in saying, we know the law is good if you use it lawfully. See, the, the people in Ephesus where, where Timothy was ministering to had this strange idea, and it's still floating around today, that if you keep the Ten Commandments, if you keep God's law, you could become more holy, more spiritual. And they miss the whole picture of God's law. God's law is not a regulation of something that we have to try and keep. It's something that shows us our need for a Savior. The whole Ten Commandments is a mirror. It's to reflect and show us our real state, that we are a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. And, and Paul makes it clear, it's not for a righteous person. Now, we know there's no one who's righteous, right? There's none except Jesus Christ. So, our righteousness is in the Lord. The only way we're a righteous person is recognizing that our righteousness is in the Lord. And once we're in the Lord, the law isn't for us. The law is for those who are walking away from the Lord, those who don't have that relationship with the Lord. And our righteousness has been provided through Jesus Christ. And there are those that are tempted to cling to the traditions of the law. And often because they find a sense of security. I know that I did this, and I did this, and I did this. I'm okay. I'm a member of the church. I gave to the church. I've been confirmed in the church. Uh, though I haven't even really been to church in 20 years, I'm still okay. <laughs> and, and people have this weird mindset. And so Paul tells us that the law is useful to expose and convict us of sin. Again, the law can't save us. It just reveals our need for a Savior. And uh, we know that when we yield to the Lord, allow His Spirit to do that work in us, then we can actually fulfill. Because we're abiding in Christ, and Christ is the only one who kept all the Ten Commandments. And Jesus really boiled it down And it two, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. The first four of the Ten Commandments deals with that vertical uh, relationship with the Lord. To love Him, right? The first of the Ten Commandments is what? You shall have no other gods before me, right? And the second is, you shall have no idols, right? Don't, make, don't put anything in the place of me. The third is to not misuse His name, right? Uh, his name is holy, right? We don't want to misuse it. And, and slander his name, right? The fourth is to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, right? Now, that's interesting. That's the only one not repeated in the New Testament for us because Jesus is our Sabbath. Our rest is in him. And we actually find that every day our rest is in him, not just one day. I don't know about you, but I need Jesus every day. <laughs> and so those first four really deal with our vertical. And then commandment six through ten deals with that horizontal, to love your neighbor as yourself, right? And, and the fifth commandment is to honor your father and your mother. If you honor your parents, then you're, you're going to be loving them as yourself. You're going to take care of them. And um, the sixth, thou shalt not murder, right? If you love your neighbor, you're not going to murder them, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> and Jesus, you know, he wants us to have that love for, for everyone. Uh, the seventh commandment is, "Thou shalt not commit adultery." And again, if you love, you're not gonna you're not gonna do that. Uh, the eighth commandment is, "Thou shalt not steal." 
you, you know, if you steal from someone, you're not loving them. The ninth commandment is, thou shalt not bear false witness or lie. Lying to someone isn't loving them. Uh, and that's interesting because even thieves that steal from people don't like other people stealing from them or lying to them. Uh, they, they, they recognize there's something wrong with that, right? <laughs> And then the Tenth Commandment, which is probably one that is the hardest here in America, thou shall not covet, right? There's so many things we can see around us that are like, oh, that's shiny. I like that. And the Lord says, no, no, no. Be content with what I've given you. Oh, yes, Lord. <laughs> and, and, and so we've got this, this, this plane of love that God has called us to. And, and Paul mentions some of those commandments here, right? Shouldn't murder your father or mother. That's the Fifth Commandment. To honor your parents and the sixth should murder. Uh, manslayers and murderers goes with that. Fornicators, that sex outside of marriage. Sodomites, that is connected to the sins of Sodom. You remember Sodom and Gomorrah where God rained down fire and brimstone? Uh, that goes with the seventh commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Kidnappers, that goes with the eighth. Thou shalt not steal. Liars, perjurers, that goes with the ninth. Thou shalt not not bear false witness. So again, the Ten Commandments is a list for us to see why we need the Lord. It's not a list for us to try and keep. The only way we can keep it is abiding in Christ. And, and supernaturally, the Holy Spirit is helping us to do it. And uh, often we don't even realize we're doing it. We're just loving the Lord and loving people. And we're actually keeping that commandment. Now, we're not trying to it's just a byproduct of abiding in Christ. And there are those out there, well, I'm a good Christian. I keep the Ten Commandments. And you go, really? <laughs> Let's go through those and see how you're doing at keeping those. And, and you can take them to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus expanded on that, right? The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, You've heard it said by them of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery in your heart. And he said, you've heard it also said, you shall not murder. But I tell you, if you hate a brother or a sister, you've committed murder in your heart. And so God's looking at the heart, right? That's, that's why Jesus said that. There were many in that crowd that, well, I'm doing okay. You know, I haven't, I haven't killed anyone. I haven't murdered anyone. But Jesus says, well, in your heart, <laughs> there are many times you've thought, God, strike down my neighbor. He's not a nice guy. You know, or I, I wish I had his horse, I wish I had his house, I wish I had his, all the things he has. And so God's looking at that heart. I love that that's why Paul says here in verse 11, that we have this glorious gospel of the blessed God which has been committed to our trust. This glorious gospel is to save lost sinners. We need the gospel message. Again, the law is a mirror, right? If you've Woken up in the morning and you go look in the mirror and you see something that isn't right <laughs> in the mirror. <laughs> you need to fix your hair or, or something, right? Brush your teeth. You got some food on you or something. But does the mirror do that work for you? No. It simply reveals it. simply shows you. You need to be washed. You need to be cleansed. You, you, you need that, that work to be done. And that's the gospel. Only the work of the gospel in our heart can change us, can cleanse us. So we want to make sure we realize that. You know, the law and the gospel do go together. But the law without the gospel is like a diagnosis without a remedy. You go around and tell people the bad news without telling them there's a cure. There's a good news. That Christ came to rescue us. He came to save us. All of us. And in fact, when he died on the cross, that blood was sufficient for every human being who will ever live. But not everyone will respond. Not everyone will receive that. And, and, and that's the tragedy, is that God has desired for all to be saved. And uh, there are those that don't believe. And sometimes it's because they've never heard of the bad news. They've never heard of the judgment. They've never realize that their sin separates them from a holy God. And then once they understand that, then they see, wow, I need a Savior. <laughs> I need someone to rescue me. So the law is not the gospel, but the gospel is not lawless. right? Without the bad news, it's hard for people to appreciate the good news. 
And so Paul is instructing Timothy to make sure he knows this, to make sure he silences those and corrects those who are teaching in, in opposition to what the scriptures teach, teaching other doctrines. Well, you know, brother, if you don't eat shellfish and you, you only go to service on Saturday on the real Sabbath, then God's going to be pleased with you. If you're not doing that, there's something wrong with you. And, and this is a point where you can take the scripture and say, well, no, no. Uh, pretty sure here that <laughs> we want what's sound doctrine, right? The, it's the gospel message. So Paul is telling Timothy, you want good leadership, you need sound doctrine. But you also need to do something else. You need to proclaim the gospel. And he shares that here in verses uh, 12 through 17. And he also shares part of his own testimony uh, in this gospel message as well. Verse 12, Paul says, and I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And this is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason, I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all on suffering, as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the keen, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God, who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. He's not done there. He just throws in the amen. The amen means simply, so be it. Uh, yes, Lord. And so, we see that Paul talks about proclaiming the gospel message. And I love what he does here in verse 12. He thanks the Lord for enabling him in the ministry. When God calls, He enables. When God calls, He equips. So often this world uh, is looking for people who are equipped. People that have the qualifications. They look at your resume. Well, you don't have any experience, but man, you've got great education. It looks like you went to the best school in the world. You're hired. And we find often they don't do so well. <laughs> And sometimes it takes a lot for the experience before they begin to do well. Yet God is looking for is not ability, but availability. God's looking for people who say, here I am, Lord. I got a lot to grow, but I'm willing to be used. And God says, perfect. I will use you. And then I'll continue to equip you. And I'll continue to enable you to do the ministry I've called you to do. And that's what Paul was reminding Timothy of here. That God calls us to do something. He gives us the ability to do it through the power of His Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, I love that Paul talks about this gospel, this glory of the blessed God. And then he gets to move to his own personal testimony. You know, Paul was exhibit A of God's mercy. And he shares really three aspects uh, in his own story here. Uh, we see in verse 13, he talks about who he used to be. We see uh, in the latter part of verse 13 through 15, he talks about how he was saved. And then in verse 16, we see what he became. And that's really the uh, simplest way to share your story, to share your testimony. Those three parts. Who you were before Christ, how you came to Christ, and who you are now in Christ. That's a testimony. It's really telling God's story of what he's done in your life and through your life. And I love that Paul can say here that he used to be a blasphemer. One who denied the deity of Christ Jesus and forced others to deny it. He's honest. <laughs> he's not trying to sugarcoat who he used to be. Yet he doesn't go into all the details. And you can go back to the book of Acts and look at that. Right, at the end of Acts chapter 8 and chapter 9. Uh, and he just says, you know, I was a persecutor. I tried to destroy the Christian church. I discovered that Christ was the Messiah. Uh, he, he realizes that 
man, he is that chief of sinners. And uh, he was also a consensor at the stoning of Stephen. Uh, he was there holding the coats of the men who stoned Stephen, the first martyr. Paul was a proud and self-righteous man. Very religious, yet not heading to heaven. And uh, he realized that. Right? He did it ignorantly. He was unbelief. So that's who he was before Christ. He was all of these things without the Lord. And then in verse, the latter part of verse 13 and 15, he tells us uh, how he, he came to Christ. And he says here in verse 14, uh, The grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And uh, he says again, he's the chief of all sinners. How could a holy and loving and just God forgive a sinner like Saul of Tarsus? Well, I love that he gives us some key words here in verse 13 and 14. In verse 13, the key word is mercy. And in verse 14, grace. Again, Paul got mercy. So often we want justice. Lord, take that terrorist that's destroying the church and wipe him off the face of the earth. <laughs> take out ISIS right now and just obliterate him. Someone was praying, Lord, save that man. Save those people. Save those individuals that are attacking the church. And God answered that prayer. And Saul of Tarsus became Paul, this preacher, this mighty man used by God. So God's mercy and love was in action. You know, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, For it's by grace you are saved through faith. Not of your works, lest anyone should boast, right? It's God's gift. It's God's grace. And it's through our faith and trust in Christ. It's not of works. And Paul realized that. And he realized, you know, I'm the chief of sinners. I love that as he does this, he's really saying, look, if God can save me and use me, he can use anyone. And that is so true. If God can, can save Paul and use him for his glory, that's good news. He can use us. He wants to use us. Have you ever attacked Christians? Have you ever imprisoned Christians? Have you ever killed Christians? Have you ever told people to, to deny Jesus Christ? Have you ever tried to chop their heads off? Well, no. Well, God can use you. <laughs> if he can use a guy like that, who, who Paul was persecuting and, and, and wreaking havoc on the church, he can use us. God is not limited to only use certain individuals. He can use anyone and everyone. In fact, you read the Old Testament, he can even use animals. He can speak through a donkey if he wants to. But God is looking for individuals who are available, whose hearts are turned towards him. And that's what happened here. Uh, and that's why I love what Paul shares here in verse 16 of who he became. He says, he obtained mercy that in him first Jesus Christ might show all on suffering or patience as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. God turned this persecutor into a preacher. From a murderer into a minister and a missionary. I mean, that's pretty awesome. And God can do the same with us. Again, we may not have that negative resume as Paul had, but we've all got a past. And God can redeem and move us forward into something glorious that he has for us. And I love that he says here that this ministry came from the Lord. Right? It was through the Lord he obtained this mercy. And Christ wanted him to be this pattern to those who were going to believe. Paul got his ministry from the Lord. He didn't go to the apostles and say, Hey Peter, I'm a believer now. What do you want me to do? What do you have for me? God called him. God instructed him. And, and that's, that's the great way uh, of, of real ministry, is that God calls us. And uh, the same is true for all of us. God has called us to ministry. He's called us to minister in home, uh, to our family. He's called us to minister at work, to our coworkers, to our boss. He's called us to minister to those in the community. Again, we need his help to do all of that. <laughs> And he desires to help us to do that. But he's called us, he'll enable us. And, and if Paul here is a pattern, right, that's what it's saying here. 
He's this type for all us sinners that they can also be proof of God's grace, that God can change anyone's life, that God can use anyone. That's good news for all of us. And so Paul is reminding Timothy of this, not only of his story, but in essence reminding Timothy, God's going to use you. God wants to use you there in Ephesus. God wants you to use you to reach those in the community. You know, be strong and of good courage. The Lord is going to enable. The Lord is going to help you through that. So Paul has reminded Timothy that good leadership must have sound doctrine and show their story of God's grace. But they must do one more thing. And he tells us here in verse 18 through 20. He says, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenius and Alexandria, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. God had chosen Timothy and called him. And, uh, you know, it was this fact that he could rely upon in difficult days. He knew that God had a purpose and a reason for the, him there in Ephesus. And he says there were some previous prophecies made concerning him. We don't know all of what those were. Paul shares a little bit, and we'll see more of that as we press into First and Second Timothy. But ultimately, it was to wage the good warfare. We are in a spiritual warfare. Uh, you may not realize that, uh, but you are a soldier in God's army. <laughs> right? There's that beautiful children's ministry song, I am in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. Uh, he's our commanding officer. And, and we're in a real spiritual battle. Now, the battle's been won, right? Christ has defeated death and, and defeated Satan. But there's a battle that keeps raging on for other people. There's a battle that rages on to, to tear us down, to destroy us. And the enemy knows if he can't take us out, he'll try and wear us out. He'll try and wear us down. And uh, he'll use other people sometimes. He'll use circumstances. And he'll do what he can to get us to, to stop following the Lord. So that's why Paul told Timothy, keep going. You know, make sure you stay with it. Make sure you have this assurance to know that what God's called you to do that you're defending the faith, you're proclaiming with your lips and your life what you believe. And that's important, that we live it out, that we show people our faith, right? That people see that we are servants, that we're not in uh, something to get something out of it, we're there to bless people. Whether that's, you know, waking up early and shoveling snow in, in, someone's, in front of someone's house, or fixing a hole in their wall, or you name it. Right? God's called us to, to be servants. He's called us to lead by example. In the community, at work, in the home. Uh, you know, if I say I love my wife and there's a stack of dishes and clothes of the, from the laundry and the house is a mess. And, uh, and I realize I could love her by hoping and I'm not. Am I really loving? Am I really being that servant leader? I'm not. So we're called to be that servant leader in all the areas of our life. And that's what really defending the faith happens here. And Paul closes with a couple of guys, Hymenaeus and Alexandria. These ones shipwrecked their faith. They were sinning against their consciences. They, they began to, to err and to begin to wander away from the grace of God. They began to go back to living for the flesh. Began to dabble in the sins that they knew were wrong. That their conscience was telling them to avoid. And what I have found that bad doctrine usually starts with bad conduct. Secret sin. So often people that are in these weird doctrines are in there because there's some secret sins going on in their life. They begin to make this doctrine so they don't feel so bad about what they're doing. <laughs> well, you know, I know I should trust in Christ for my salvation, but I kind of like the fact that I can do some things to make me feel better like I contributed to my salvation. And that's the sin of idolatry, right? You're not really trusting the sufficiency of Christ. So that's what Paul is reminding Timothy here, that we want to have that life that honors the Lord. So in closing, 
like unto Timothy, God has called you. And, and all of our ministries are different, but we're all in the ministry. And if you didn't know that, well, welcome to the ministry. <laughs> God has called you to the ministry. Again, all of our ministries look different. Uh, God has called us to serve people, to love people, to help people come to know the Lord, to help them grow on the love and knowledge of the Lord, to do what we can to plant seeds, to water seeds. Maybe we get to be a part of the harvest of that seed to see people come to Christ. But the only way that's not going to happen is if we keep seeds in our pocket, right? If we don't share that good news. And so we want our words and our actions to declare that. That people can see that we are in love with the Lord and we want others to know that. So there's a lot of things we could do. A lot of programs and activities. We've had people suggest some of those. We could do some... Some big giveaway prizes and all kinds of things and smoke machines and you name it, right, in the church. But if it doesn't draw people from their need to put their trust in Christ, to grow in Christ, to be encouraged to share Christ, it needs to be abandoned. It's not a part of what God's called us to do. (laughs) And, And so often, so many churches, so many programs out there can be helpful, but there's a lot out there that is just there. It's for the sake of, we've always done it this way. So we want to make sure we're doing the things that God has called us to do. And that we're doing those things that are encouraging people. That are helping people come to to the Lord. And, uh, And that's true leadership. Is that we're following Jesus Christ, leading by example. And as we do that, we're leading other people towards the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your example of your love of sending your son, Jesus Christ, to come to this earth to suffer and die on that wooden Roman cross for our sins, that he shed his blood there for us, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that this blood was sufficient, that it was paid in full, all of our debt, all of our sin, totally erased and gone forevermore. And that on that cross, Jesus, you cried out, it is finished. No works, nothing we can do just to trust and believe in you. That you were in that tomb and rose from the grave. That through your resurrection, you can resurrect our hearts. Give us that life that forgiveness, that eternal relationship with you. God, we thank you for your leadership. We thank you for a godly leadership and the example of those in the scripture. We thank you for those in our lives, Lord, who have been godly examples. We ask, Lord, you help each of us here and now to be those examples in our home, at our work, in our community. So those around who are watching, that we'd love them through our words and we love them through our lives. And God, may you get all the glory because we're simply following you, the best leader, the best foundation for our lives. And Lord, we ask that if there be any here this morning who need to surrender their life to you, they need to commit their life to you, that they do that this morning. That Lord, they'd realize their need for you, that their sin separates them from you, that they'd repent of their sin. They'd turn and put their trust and faith in you because you died on the cross for our sins, were buried and rose again. So Father, we pray that you'd be working on hearts. We thank you, Jesus, for doing that work. And we ask, Lord, that you continue to change us and transform us to become more and more like you. So Father, if there be any here who want to get right with you, perhaps listening to this message later online. If that's you and you want to do that, to say yes to Jesus, I simply want to lead you in a prayer where you commit your life to Jesus Christ. If that's you, I encourage you to pray this prayer after me. God, I realize that I'm a sinner and that my sin separates me from you. I understand now that This is why Jesus came. To die on the cross for my sins. To be buried with my sin. And to rise from the grave. 
defeating the penalty of my sin and offering me life and forgiveness. Jesus, I ask that you come into my heart, come into my life, forgive me of my every sin, wash me clean, cleanse me from all unrighteousness, change me and transform me as you see fit. Jesus, I thank you for loving me. I thank you for knowing me. I thank you for saving me and for being my friend. And I pray from this day forward, by your spirit, you'd empower me to live for you, to be a light to all those around. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.